Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome also to a group of uh, American students with their professors who are present here with us this evening. Welcome to this year's Peace Symposium, which is a key event organized by the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community of Malta. And this year marks the 10th Peace Symposium to date. This event promotes a deeper understanding and seeks to inspire a concerted effort for lasting peace. The theme for this year's Peace Symposium is The Challenges of the 21st Century, Education and Peace. With us to deliver their views on this theme, we have four distinguished guest speakers. Mr. Aaron Abdillah, on behalf of the Honorable Minister for Education and Employment. Mr. Justin Schembri, on behalf of the Honorable Shadow Minister for Education. Reverend John Berry, lecturer at the Faculty of Theology at the University of Malta, and Imam Lake Ahmed Atif, president of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat Malta. But before proceeding, let us first hear a reading from the Holy Quran by Mr. Rana Akbar. <laughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن الناس والدواب والأنعام والأنعام مختلف ألوانه كذلك إنما يخشى الله من إباده الألماء إن الله عزيز غفور and of men and beasts and cattle in like manner there are various colors only those of his servants who possess knowledge fear Allah verily Allah is mighty most forgiving thank you Mr. Rana Agapar we can now proceed with the main part of this year's Ahmadiyya Peace Symposium our four distinguished guests will each deliver a speech on this year's theme the challenges of 21st century, century, education and peace, but obviously focusing from different points of view. The first speaker will be Mr. Aaron Abdillah, who will deliver his speech on behalf of the Honorable Minister for Education and Employment. Mr. Abdillah will deal with the importance of education in promoting peace. Following Mr. Abdillah, we'll invite Mr. Justin Shkembri, who on behalf of the Honorable Shadow Minister for Education will be asking what role education plays to counter challenges of the 21st century. Our third distinguished speaker, Reverend John Berry, lecturer at the Faculty of Theology at the University of Malta, will be giving us a Christian perspective to the challenges of our times and to basic principles for peace. The concluding speech will be delivered by Imam Lake Ahmed Latif, president of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat Malta. Imam Lake will uh, give us an Islamic perspective to the challenges of the 21st century and fundamental principles for lasting peace. Following the four distinguished speakers, you, our guests, are also invited and you also have the opportunity of giving us your views on the challenges of the 21st century, that is, education and peace. You can also comment on what would have been said during the previous four speeches. Surely our guests will, uh, will be delighted to reply to your comments and questions. And in fact, during this symposium, we will also hand out um, uh, a card in, on which you can write also your comments or even your questions. I will now kindly invite our first guest speaker, Mr. Aaron Abdillah, who on behalf of the Honorable Minister for Education and Employment, will deliver the opening speech which will uh, touch on the importance of education in promoting peace. <laughs> <laughs> 
Mr. Aaron Abdullah. Good evening. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here today with you. I really would have liked here today to come and, and present some kind of magic formula where, where you know, peace can, can actually happen and can be attained through education. But uh, I think that this symposium puts us in the right direction. As the title suggests, the 21st century um, offers us some challenges, which if properly understood, might be able to offer us an opportunity. The 21st century is marked with a number of events that are a constant reminder of those challenges that we, are more that we or more globally, the world is facing. Now, after 9-11, the Western civilization became aware that the new threat to peace shifted, shifted towards the issue of radicalization of religion. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm a bit nervous. It's my first public speech, so <laughs> please bear with me. Um, so as I was saying, with 9-11, uh, with the whole thing just shifted. Um, and actually catapulting us towards a new narrative, well, actually an old narrative, the old-fashioned tug-of-war crusade narrative, um, uh, where East against West and religion against secularization. Again in Charlie Hebdo in France and the Westminster Bridge attack, among several others, show us that this challenge is not a simple one and should give in the utmost importance. One may ask, however, what reflections can be drawn, from example, the Muslim perpetrators, which by no coincidence were also citizens of the same country which they acted against. A deeper reflection would dismiss the act only as a cause, as a simple cause of ra radicalization, but rather enable us to identify radicalization as a symptom caused by a lack of societal integration. My intention here is to help to give a better un explanation and understanding regarding the clash of civilization a clash which manifests itself through imbalance between one's own cultural traditions and what we can call the other. This leads us to another type of radicalization, evidently present in the 21st century, but far more latent in the Western civilization. This is the radicalization of modern culture, a radicalization that brought the so-called disenchantment of the world, or in other words, the dissolvement of religion of religious and traditional worldviews. This radicalization of modern culture created the conditions of such imbalance between culture and society. The rapid and accelerated change in Western culture through modern science pervading in our everyday life is also crystallized as a belief within the secularization process of the West. In other words, science becomes a new belief, a new belief which keeps on pervading our everyday life, everyday communication, the languages of the market and of the bureaucratic systems become our languages, the way how we deal with each other instrumentally. You know, we, we act as um, how we can give the least and obtain the most, also between friends. This pervasion can be said to be the cause of additional suffering of those who are experiencing and witnessing the collapse of their own traditions. Hence, I would like to address a question which goes way back to the medieval period, but I believe that it's still very relevant till nowadays. This is precisely where the topic of faith and knowledge comes into play. Secularization has been understood by many as the only means for a liberal state to guarantee not only its neutrality, but also peace amongst its citizens. Yet it keeps, us, it keeps on depleting the traditional horizons in which religious communities are to this very day still finding their sense of belonging and sense of self-identity. The collision of the two great rivals of faiths, the organized science and organized faith of religion, is what underlines the statement of the clash of civilizations. 
I dare move on to say that there is the need, an imminent need, to find a common language between the secular and the religious. This becomes the case particularly when revisiting the claim made by the renowned American sociologist Peter Berger. I quote, the assumption that we live in a secularized world is false. Indeed, when one takes a moment and observes around him to look at the country one lives in, the society that we are part of, one comes to realize that the persistent existence of religious communities is a proof that we are now living in a post-secular society. I note here that this does not translate itself in any way as some kind of victory for the existing religious communities against secularization, which naturally oppose each other. Rather, there is the need to go beyond the idea of a secularization war, which will in reality result in a zero-sum game. The term of secular society, as defined by Jürgen Habermas, a contemporary author pertaining to the critical theory school of thought, is explained as the emergence of religious communities in the public sphere wherein secularization process is still dominant. So one's come to ask himself, how is this conflict is to be avoided? How can these two real realities, which in them themselves appear to collide once more with each other, actually avoid this conflict? I believe that here a proper understanding of education as an informal process and as a lifelong journey can provide us with a suitable answer. There is the need for a learning process to materialize in contemporary culture. In lay terms, this learning process could be referred to as the ability to learn to live together. This could offer a balance between faith and knowledge, or believers and non-believers. However, this is only possible if we bring both worlds and to, together and to learn to talk with each other rather than about each other. For this to happen, it is important to recognize that there is still a cognitive potential in religious discourse, which the Enlightenment in its secularized process not always managed to translate, such as the redemptive power and the sense of hope, which the secularized West seems to have lost along the way. Certainly my assertion here, it is implied that religious discourse contain within itself some cognitive validity and truth which science fails to grasp. But then again, how are we to achieve all of this? As suggested, a magic Abracatabra is not part of the equation, unfortunately, or else we wouldn't have this symposium here today. Nonetheless, if we want and are willing to mend this controversial boundary between faith and knowledge, as Habermas himself suggested, and I quote, our journey must be understood as a cooperative venture carried out by both sides and we each, with each side trying to see issue from the other's perspective. Ultimately, this is what democracy is all about. The ability to learn to deal with ideological pluralism, with the acceptance of fallibility. It is only in this way that we can understand the secular principles of decision making, which can then be translated in the meaning of a post-secular society. Then in this sense, post-secular society would enable the two worlds living together. It's not that with the whole enlightenment process of secularization, also if we think about the 30 year war when it was happening, philosophers stood around the table and said, well, we cannot allow this to happen. We should think about doing something, how we can do it. Let's repress religion. And that's what we did with the whole enlightenment process. Um, uh, we, we thought to remove the whole religious discourse away from, uh, from, from, uh, from our Western civilization. But in a post-secular society, the, uh, again, we get this conscience that religion is still present among us. So in this sense, the democratic background in our constitution can provide us with the framework for a mutual understanding and recognition. 
nonetheless not without discomfort. I would like to underline here that the importance of, of finding a common language between the two rival of faiths is something yet to be discovered. Earlier on, I mentioned that secularization needs to accept that religious discourse could contain cognitive truth. However, on the other hand, religious communities need to accept the framework in which they are living in. Thus, religious consciousness must handle the encounter with other faiths cognitively, that is, as a knowledge process, and accept the possibility of their fallibility. Then, religious communities need to recognize the premises which a democratic state is founded upon, that is, the non-sacred concept of morality. As a result, religious communities need to put their efforts in translating their religious discourse in a secularized form in order to be reasonably accepted by the whole. Certainly, this proposal is not a simple one. The essential learning process requires both parties to move from their comfort zone and go beyond their territory with the, with the hope of establishing a social bond based on mutual recognition. I believe that this position of understanding and action can provide a way forward and leads cultural conflict in the right direction within the democratic process. I would like to conclude this intervention by giving an example about how secular reason and faith in fact, can collaborate and even more so learn from each other. This becomes evident when we refer to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights with its first, first article, excuse me, calling for unity and brotherhood among men and women as being equal in dignity. This leads me to refer to a biblical reference, Genesis 1:27. I quote, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created him. A passage which reminds us about our shared humanity as equal beings created in the image of God and hence equal in rights and in dignity, in virtue of our same nature as being the image of God. What I have tried to express is that a proper understanding of democratically constitutional mentality, and I highlight mentality, can offer within itself, well, I highlight just to go, but I highlight mentality is because if we don't have that kind of mentality, then the democratic process cannot happen, regardless whether you're Muslim, Catholic, Protestant, and so on, and so whatever, or even if you're an atheist. If you, if you don't have that kind of mentality, this mutual recognition cannot happen. So, as I was saying, can offer within itself an educational transformation of an irreconcilable, of an apparent irreconcilable world. In this sense, making possible pluralistic ideologies to learn from each other through mutual recognition and understanding without the need to resort to violence. I leave it up to you to give some time to reflect on Muhammad Rumi's saying, which I think it perfectly captures the implication of democracy as, as an educational program. Rumi says, raise your words, not voice. It is rain that grows flowers, not thunder. Thank you. What role education plays to counter challenges of the 21st century? To try to answer this question, I kindly invite Mr. Justin Schembri on behalf of the Honorable Shadow Minister for Education. Mr. Justin Schembri. The President and members of Ahmadiyya Muslim community, speakers and best guests, good evening. It is an honor for me to represent the opposition while discussing such an important issue, but it is also a special moment and an honor for me personally, for I have known Mr. Atif for the past 10 years, and I am pleased to say that I have dedicated, as much as himself, a lot of hours because he wanted to learn the Maltese language, and I can say that in 10 years he can fluently speak and understand Maltese. 
Thank you. O grazie, tal beveria. A Latin saying says, if you want war, prepare for peace. Although this might surprise you all, we have to acknowledge that we live in troubled times, where the great conflicts of ideology are being replaced by ones based on identity, ethnicity, culture, and religion. In an era where social media dominates society, young people nowadays have direct access to information, which may not always be the information one would want our children to acquire. The digital era has changed the way our children perceive their own society, and their influence on society today builds tomorrow's society. Nowadays, massive amounts of information can be accessed through the internet, by which has led to an ever-growing trend towards self-radicalization through the net. Ranging from ISIS and Al-Qaeda to extreme right-wing lone wolves like Andres Breivik in Norway, we have seen this phenomena multiplying itself in tragic consequences. Sadly, in Malta, we also find this reality with access to virtual media causing moral panics from time to time. Without wanting to ignore serious concerns with regards to issues like migration and cultural integration, I would like to point out one major issue that emerged from this whole phenomena, that of control. How can we, in a democratic society, control extremist ideas in such a free-flowing source such as online media? And how can we control what we deem as hate speech in times when we support freedom of speech? All these aspects have been and are still subjects of intense debates worldwide. In my humble opinion, education is the means to tackle such issues. And as Gandhi stated way back in 1937, education is a means to all round progress of man, the pathway to human development. Therefore, if education leads to human development, it leads to peace. Education, especially when it's combined with technical training, has been proven to reduce poverty. This is one driving knowledge. Behind education, there's always peace. With education, however, comes knowledge, power, safety, security. One study by UNESCO found that income around the world would be 20% higher per capita in countries with education for all. If poverty were reduced, violence would follow suit. There's no doubt that education for peace leads to career enhancement, employment opportunities, and chances of higher earnings. But as politicians here, we have a role. We must invest in what leads to education of the 21st century, and this is beyond the classroom's curriculum. The coalition P21, Partnership for 21st Century Learning, has identified four skills of today. Creativity, critical thinking, communication, and collaboration. These four teams are not to be understood as units or even as subjects, but as teams that we should be overlaid across all curriculum mapping and strategic planning. Creativity is about thinking through information in different ways, making new connections and coming up with innovative solutions. Critical thinking is about analyzing information. Communication is, of course, understanding things well enough to share them clearly with other people who, at times, may not share the same religious, ethnic, or ideological background. Collaboration is about teamwork and the collective genius of a group that prepares our children for a caring and sharing society. As a representative of the Nationalist Party here, I represent a party with a rich history of engagement and work in the educational sector that comes from a vision that is both national and international. This vision for education walked hand in hand with one which saw our nation's place within the European family. 
In line with the Christian democratic popular vision of mainland Europe, the PN was for many years the voice calling for full EU membership, a vision attained despite all opposition in 2003, a vision which along with its battle over education is now accepted across all political lines in Malta. These two visions in education and openness are the contribution of the Partit Nazionalista, the Nationalist Party, towards an education for peace. Now, together as a nation, alongside the government of the day, and also as full member states of the European Union, in this age of fundamentalism and conflicts of cultures and civilization, we believe that the solution in education which leads towards openness, one which tempers the strength of science with the gentleness of humanities and art, a vision in which universalism is built on respect between our people with Christian and humanistic values and the rest of the world in a field of peace and cooperation. I conclude by stating that our only channel is education for all where we can all learn and challenge for a better future. Thank you very much. The next two speakers will treat this subject from a religious point of view. First, we'll be having a Christian perspective to the challenges of our times and on the basic principles for peace. So I kindly invite Reverend John Berry, lecturer at the Faculty of Theology at the University of Malta, to deliver his speech. Father Berry. Esteemed President of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat Malta, Imam Lai Ahmed Atif, dear guests and friends, good evening. I'm truly honored and uh, delighted to participate in this National Peace Symposium. Faith has a role to play in the public sphere and in the public square, and it is our duty to strengthen our efforts in acting as peace builders for a better world. People long to see us together and engage in respectful dialogue. This state, too, requires our pastoral service to ensure harmony and peace, and we need each other to stand together and to transmit a sense of belonging and security in a world marked by many conflicts and the feeling of global uncertainty. In other words, we need to lead by example. Dialogue and proclamation do not exclude one another. They are intimately connected and though the distinction must be maintained, the two should never be confused or instrumentalized or judged equivalent. Coming here together today represents our commitment to a true and lasting peace while saying no to fanaticism, say no to violence. Peace is a gift from God. Peace is the fruit of human endeavor. There can be no peace without justice and equality among all. Promoting a culture of peace is everyone's duty, particularly religious leaders, each within his respective community. And also, peace also depends on politicians who direct a country. Religious efforts should blend with the socio-political commitment to ensure harmony, unity, security, and peace in the Malta of the third millennium. One privileged way of promoting mutual respect is education. It helps us understand each other and the state should step up its role as a facilitator in this regard. The church in Malta stands as a pioneer in fostering dialogue and peace already in the 50s. One of its most recent decisions was the foundation of the, the Diocesan Commission for Interges Dialogue on the 2nd of March in 2011. 
although a diocesan delegate for interreligious dialogue was already appointed in the 1970s. Moreover, it is public knowledge that church schools are open also to non-Christian students, even though small in number. So we need more signs and gestures from all parts that respect the religion of the other, its teachings, its symbols, and its values. The changing scenario of today's Malta, having almost 40,000 foreigners registered to work in our country, less than one-third being third-country nationals, evidences the presence of different traditions and principles. This means that while the emphasis of the separation of the church and the state is correct, the possibility of toning down religion's influence in society can lead to unhappy consequences in Malta of the near future. Religious education should not teach us how to tolerate each other, but rather to enable us to cherish each other's values and traditions. Instead of removing symbols, we should learn of each other's religious sensibilities. We should not be afraid to dialogue, to love each other as we are, and to promote peace through noble actions. In other words, it is pointless to preach against racism, anti-Semitism and religious intolerance while simultaneously undermining the essential ingredient, ingredient which, go, which could go a long way towards eradicating such threats, namely religious education within the public domain. It is precisely when children are allowed to participate and celebrate with their peers within an educational environment, those feasts, feasts that lie at the heart of their respective religious communities, that they grow up loving and respecting each other's religious differences. It is when children learn about each other's religious affiliations that they also learn to respect each other and grow in responsible and tolerant adults. If we uphold Aristotle's definition of education as induction into society, we might well maintain that religious education is the best form of induction into a multi-religious society. Learning about and sharing the riches of each religious community could yet become the best way forward for promoting religious tolerance and progress. Malta has been a sacred island, a cross of civilizations and a ground for interreligious dialogue. Even today we are celebrating in Malta a stronger Christian, Muslim and Orthodox presence. The Catholic parishes, parish churches of the English and Italian speaking communities as well as the Filipino Catholic community in Malta have all seen an increase. This is also true of the Greek Catholic Church in Valletta, particularly through the Greek and Ukrainian presence in Malta. A stronger Orthodox presence is also felt within the Serbian, Russian, Romanian and Bulgarian nationals in Malta. Muslim presence too is also felt through Muslim European and non-European nationals in Malta. My point here is that religious education and education for religion, for, for peace, certainly form a backbone to moral education and hence a healthy society. Sincere ignorance of religions may eventually distort culture. They can lead to xenophobia and possible intolerance. And I see three main challenges that must be overcome. First, short-sightedness. Our society is becoming fragmented by a way of thinking that is inherently short-sighted. Disregarding the full horizon of truth, the truth about God and about humans, means failing to see the whole picture. To live and flourish in unity, order and harmony requires a common effort from the state 
and all religious religions to stand together and respect each other, other's end. Secondly, prejudice and impatience. These are a great obstacle to progress. Education is fundamental in strengthening dialogue and in using reason. Prejudice is the child of ignorance. Unless religious dialogue takes place in all spheres of life, the chains forged by ignorance could keep us apart. Moreover, there should be no rash judgments about religions or interreligious dialogue, neither in politics nor in socio-religious life. Impatience can cause wise people to do foolish things. Thirdly, skepticism. Spaces need to be created for constant kindness to be witnessed and transmitted on. When mistrust comes in, love goes out. Through charitable dialogue, mutual respect and generous kindness, all misunderstanding, mistrust and hostility slowly fade away. The key to overcome today's challenges is then to rediscover the role of religion in society, as has been mentioned by the first speaker tonight, this evening, and also the state's responsibility to collaborate and support religious initiatives and religious presence in Malta. In this regard, to conclude, allow me to present three basic principles for peace. First, respect. It is obvious, isn't it, that everyone requires respect and everyone wants to be respected. So this is the first basic principle. Dialogue is possible only by beginning with one's own identity. Respect means an attitude of kindness towards people for whom we have consideration and esteem. Mutual means that this is not a one-way process, but something shared by both sides. In my view, more can be done, particularly through education, in order that humans are fully respected for their life, for their physical integrity, dignity and the rights deriving from their dignity, reputation, property, ethnic and cultural identity, ideas and political choices. Families, schools, religious teaching and all forms of media have a role to play in achieving this goal. Let us avoid unfair criticism once and for all and let us avoid defamation. Second, a second principle is collaboration. There should be opportunities for an open dialogue on many issues, including those related to fundamental human rights, in particular religious freedom in all its aspects, for everybody, for every community, everywhere. Eventual collaboration bears witness to a human pilgrimage towards the truth realized in freedom and serenity. Here again, religions require humble leaders to come together and direct their communities in the name of peace and dialogue. It requires humility and readiness to come together. Lastly, there is a basic principle, and that is safeguarding. While the vilification of religion was struck off in the criminal record some months ago in the name of modernity, the state and all are responsible to bring up our young people, irrespective of their beliefs, to think and speak respectfully of other religions and their followers and to avoid ridiculing or denigrating their convictions and practices. Freedom of speech should not be seen as a passport to psychological abuse. Politicians in this respect should, should safeguard freedom of conscience and of religion as to give space for unity in diversity. To conclude, like Christ on the way to Emmaus, the Church is ever more committed to travel along the path of dialogue and to intensify the already fruitful cooperation with all those who, belonging to different religious traditions, share her intention 
to build relations of friendship and share in the many initiatives to do with dialogue. With these sentiments, I reiterate my hope that everyone and everyone in this room may be a true promoter of mutual respect and friendship, in particular through education. Thank you very much. After the Christian perspective of the, to the challenges of our times and on the basic principles for peace, we shall now be presented with an Islamic perspective to the challenges of the 21st century and the fundamental principles for lasting peace. And to present these views, I kindly invite Imam Lake Ahmed Atif, President Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamad, Malta. Auz billahi min ash-shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Gracious, the Merciful. Highly distinguished speakers, esteemed guests, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum. May peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. I would like to, first of all, take this opportunity to thank you all for taking time to attend this peace symposium. Your presence here shows your open-heartedness and your wish towards peace. The topic of my speech is that the challenges of 21st century and fundamental principles for lasting peace and Islamic perspective. In the contemporary world we live in is constantly evolving and advancing. Undoubtedly, in the recent decades, the world has moved forward in leaps and bounds in terms of scientific advancement and technological development. With God-given faculties and abilities, man has advanced immensely in productivity, efficiency, and personal comfort. However, it is a cause of deep regret that at a time when humanity is progressing at such a rapid pace, it is also moving further apart and becoming increasingly divided. Peace is diminishing every moment. Loud and ta tall claims are being made, but are not being translated into actions effectively and significantly. Walls of hatred are being erected in every part of the world. Leaders and governments are failing to effectively fulfill the rights of their people and are inflicting grave cruelties and injustices upon them. Members of the public are rising up in opposition. Conflicts are erupting and the conflict zones are becoming fertile breeding grounds for terrorists and extremist groups. Violence, fake news, hate speech, racism, greed, religious persecution, offending other sentiments, inequality, injustices, and the race for the production of most sophisticated weapons are few among many other challenges the world is facing today. In this short time available, I cannot speak about all the challenges. However, I will try to address a few of these challenges according to the teachings of Islam. Dear audience, education is a key to the lasting and effective peace. Islam enormously emphasizes about the importance of education. The very first verse revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be on him, was, Read, O Muhammad, in the name of your Lord who created, who created man from a clot of blood, read, and thy Lord is most generous. We taught man by the pen. He taught man what he knew not. The word ilm, meaning knowledge, or education has been used repeatedly in the Holy Quran. Moreover, God has also taught a prayer in the Holy Quran for all people that Rabbe Zidni Ilma, meaning, O oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. These words show the great importance that the Quran attaches to the acquirement of knowledge. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be on him, said, Seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. 
and that seek knowledge, though it may be found in a country as far as China. In our times, many predominant disorders and inherent dangers to the world peace spring from the concept of nationalism or racial superiority and establishing equality among all the children of Adam has become a challenge for the entire world. The Holy Quran presents a fundamental charter of human, human dignity and equality by declaring that, O mankind, we have created you from male and female, and we have made you into tribes and clans that you may recognize one another. The Quran thus makes clear that all people are born equal. Furthermore, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be on him, said, You are all equal. Arabs have no superiority over non-Arabs, nor have the non-Arabs any superiority over Arabs. Similarly, the white and red races have no superiority over black races, and black races have no superiority over the white. According to the Holy Quran, every form of racism must be stampeded out from the world. Without this, peace can never be established. Quran has given an excellent teaching in this respect. It states, O ye who believe, let not one people deride another people who may be better than they, nor let women deride other women who may be better than they, and do not slander your own people, nor taunt each other with nicknames. Furthermore, Islam sets forth the fundamental principle of freedom of expression and freedom of religion as an effective tool for peace. Islam rejects the idea of imposition of any religion or ideology on others, and persecution is seen as a grave threat to peace. It states, persecution is worse than killing. Moreover, it says, there should be no compulsion in religion whatsoever. One other thing that is preventing world peace is the tendency to insult other religions, their holy books, and their holy people. Quran, once again, has strongly condemned this trend and teaches that everyone must respect others' religious sentiments and abstain from any act that may lead to any agitation or violence. Freedom needs to be exercised within the boundaries of responsibility and prudence. In the Holy Quran, this tendency is discussed not only with regard to God, but also idols and imaginary objects of worship besides God are also discussed. One is overwhelmed by the beauty of Islamic teachings when one reads that, revile not those whom they call upon beside Allah, lest they out of spite revile Allah in their ignorance. Another principle that we have been taught for restoring peace in the world is not to greedily eye the wealth of others. Emphasizing this principle, the Holy Quran says, and, rest and, restrain, and restrain not thy eyes after what we have bestowed on some classes of them to enjoy for a short time the splendor of the present world that we may try them thereby. Covetously taking the wealth or natural resources of others is a cause of increasing restlessness in the world. Another weakness that has contributed to the destruction of peace is mistrust and the evil of lying. This moral weakness has been utterly destructive for world peace. Allah the Almighty says, O ye who believe, fear Allah and say the right word. And then he says, and shun all words of untruth. In order to establish peace, Islam also places great emphasis on the fulfillment of one's trust. It says, Verily, Allah commands you to make over the trust to those entitled to them, and that, when you judge between people, judge with justice. Further afield, one challenge is that instead of traveling upon a path of justice and integrity, priority is given to personal interests and benefits. As time is limited, I shall cite just two verses of the Holy Quran that illustrate Islam's unparalleled teachings of fairness and justice. The Holy Quran says, O ye who believe, be strict in observing justice, and be witnesses for Allah, even though it may be against yourself, or against parents and kindred. Whether he be rich or poor, Allah is more regardful of them both than you are. Therefore, follow not low desires, so that you may be able to act equitably, 
And if you conceal the truth or evade it, then remember that Allah is well aware of what you do. What a wonderful principle has been led of giving testimony against oneself or the family members in order to establish peace and truth and for justice to be served. Loyalty to the truth must take precedence over everything else. Thereafter, the Holy Quran states, O ye who believe, be steadfast in the cause of Allah, bearing witness in equity, and let not people's enmity incite you to act otherwise than with justice. Be always just. This verse commands to being fair and just with all parties, including the enemies and opponents. This is the exalted standard of justice advocated by Islam for the establishment of peace and prosperity in the world. Islam also presents remedies and solutions to the increasing conflicts. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be on him, has taught a golden principle to end such conflicts. He said, help both the afflicted and the cruel. The companions of the Prophet inquired that whereas they could understand helping the afflicted, how could they help a cruel person? The Prophet responded by saying, by stopping his hand from committing cruelty, because his excess in cruelty will make him worthy of God's punishment. So out of mercy, you try to save him. This principle extends beyond the smallest fibers of society to the international level. In this connection, the Holy Quran says, and if two parties of believers fight against each other, make peace between them. Then if after that, one of them transgresses against the other, fight the party that transgresses until it returns to the command of Allah. Then if it returns, make peace between them with equity and act justly. By adhering to this principle, the foundations of peace on a worldwide basis can be led. The prevalent challenge of extremism and violence has also shaken the entire world. Terrorism and violence has infl infiltrated and penetrated through, throughout the world and it hasn't bared even schools, universities, hospitals, innocent children, women and men. Condemning such violence, the Holy Quran declares that whosoever killed a person unless it be for killing a person or for creating disorder in the land, it shall be as if he had killed all mankind. And whoso gave life to one, it shall be as if he had given life to all mankind. Thus, to establish peace, the sanctity of human life must be honored at every cost. Islam also presents a mutual cooperation for the common good, for the common good of mankind as an essential principle for peace. It says, and help one another in righteousness and piety, but help not one another in sin and transgression. As I earlier mentioned, where modern technology has served in positivity, it has also been used as a force for evil and destruction. Such technology has been developed that has the capability of wiping nations off the map with the press of a button. And recently, we have been listening and watching on the news those threats and challenges that some are saying that I have the button next to my table and the vice versa. So the issue is these threats we are facing. So such technology has been developed at the capability of wiping nations off the map with the press of a button. Such weapons of mass destruction are developed that are capable of inflicting the most unimaginable horrors, devastation and destruction. Such weapons are being produced that have the potential to destroy not only the civilization today, but to also leave behind a legacy of misery for generations to come. The world today is fraught with danger and turmoil. We sit at an extremely critical juncture. The dark clouds of Third World War are looming above our heads and are getting darker and heavier every day. 
the head of the the current head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community had foreseen such scenario and few years back he warned the world and he said it is my fear that in view of the directions in which things are moving today the political and economic dynamics of the countries of the world may lead to a world war it is not only the poorer countries of the world but also the richer nations that are being affected by this therefore it is the duty of the superpowers to sit down and find a solution to save humanity from the brink of disaster i think the time has arrived to face these grave challenges with sincerity loyalty wisdom and with great responsibility for the prosperous and peaceful future of our of our remarkable planet there is an urgent need of indiscriminate deweaponization and denuclearization of the entire world it is a high time to put an end to the production sale and usage of such sophisticated weapons the world needs to agree that without any prejudice or privilege and without any discriminatory veto power no country of the world be it small or big should produce such weaponry and instead of sowing the seeds of hatred malice and enmity we must sow the seeds of love harmony and brotherhood instead of erecting the high and concrete walls that keep us apart we must pursue towards building bridges between people and nations in addition in preference to living in self pride arrogance and egoism we must selflessly show merciful love and compassion to all mankind so that peace can be established and cherished by all humanity the holy prophet of islam laid down in just a few words the foundations for peace in the world and between all people the prophet of islam said a person should desire for others whatever he desires for himself i believe that this timeless principle is as true today as it ever was in the past certainly every person desires peace for themselves and to be saved from all anxieties and worries every person hopes that he or she has the means to live comfortably and without hardships every person seeks good health so that they can enjoy their lives free from pain or difficulty every person craves good standing in their community and the respect of others in a similar vein every government and every nation also seeks such prosperity however how many people or nations are there who truly desire peace prosperity and success for others not in words alone but also in actions the motto of the motto love for all hated for none of the ahmadiyya muslim community which you can see in front of you this motto in fact is the essence of the entire islamic teachings and is a wonderful principle for the prosperity and peace of the entire world if we follow this very simple but profound motto i'm sure that the world can become a better place for us and for our generations to come and we must extend this message love for all hatred hatred to none to all people irrespective of the color creed uh, religion or nationality to conclude without god there can be no peace this is the ultimate islamic philosophy without returning to god one cannot attain peace and without that peace peace in society cannot be built all human efforts to create peace from selfish ulterior motives are bound to fail and come to nothing if there is no god there is no peace that is the ultimate wisdom with these words i thank you all thank you very much god bless you in abundance My name is Susan Hirsch. 
I'm a professor at George Mason University in the United States. I teach in a school for conflict analysis and resolution. Attending a peace symposium tonight was really exciting for me, uh, particularly because of my work in conflict. And uh, this, uh, the 10th peace symposium, brought together a wide range of opinions. I, I think that's important to hear about uh, the role of education in relation to peace from people in the political realm, uh, from people in the religious realm, and across different, different religions. So I would say we need more um, events like this. Uh, there was quite a bit of audience participation and some hard questions asked because there's quite a bit more to be done in relation to peace through education particularly the group of students that I attended with raised the question of how uh, education is being um, provided to migrants in particular and that peace in Malta, the Mediterranean, broader in the world really needs to include everyone. I hope to attend another one of these in uh, in the future and look for even more diversity on the panel um, with respect maybe to other religions, to including women uh, and uh, maybe even a range of ages. So thank you uh, to the Amadia community and to tonight's speakers. Well, I came uh, here today to represent the Honorable Minister Everest Bartol and the Symposium on Peace and Education. I think uh, that the event was uh, I think was was very important, was important in itself simply to discuss about those issues. I think those issues are very relevant today for, our, for us and also to enable to understand better each other, to understand different cultures, different backgrounds that they can actually come together. Um, uh, today in the panel we had different, uh, different people, we had from different backgrounds, we had the Imam, Atif, um, uh, the, uh, the priest uh, representing the Catholic faith, um, uh, Reverend Barry, um, uh, myself representing the minister and, and also the opposition, um, uh, Mr. Shkembri, Mr. President. And, uh, and through all this, it just showed how much is possible that different views can come up together and discuss such important issues. Well, I wish you best of luck and to continue your great endeavor in promoting peace um, uh, everlasting. Thank you. I'm John Berry, uh, priest and a lecturer at University of Malta. Uh, this evening I've been invited to talk about uh, Interges Dialogue uh, in view of uh, education and um, promoting peace in Malta and in the world. It has been such an enriching uh, experience for me. Uh, first of all, because I've, I have encountered the different faiths, we have came, to come, came together uh, to discuss uh, different uh, ideas. Um, and uh, what was particularly intriguing was when we emphasized the main challenges and also which are the basic principles to uh, sustain uh, not simply education but also intelligence dialogue. Um, in my view, what comes to mind and uh, what I would love to share right now is that phrase uh, in, the, in the scripture, 1 Peter uh, 3.15, where it says that we should be ready and prepared to give account of the hope there is in us. And um, uh, that's what interjust dialogue is after all, isn't it? To be ready to discuss, to come together uh, at a table, uh, to uh, come to know each other, to recognize each other, to appreciate the, the talents, the goodness there is in each other's traditions, values and faiths. And um, this sentence from scripture uh, finishes uh, that uh, one's account should be given with uh, gentleness and respect. And in the end, this is what we have been trying to do to uh, treat each other amicably while respecting our different faiths and emphasizing uh, what we could do next. And that is having our hearts prepared to receive each other in friendship, love and serenity. I'm Justin Shkembri. I am representing the Nationalist Party. 
in this uh, interreligious dialogue. I think it is very important for different political parties, different NGOs, to sit around the table and discuss the way forward to attain peace. This day, we've discussed about the role of education, and I think we all have contributed towards the fact that education is a very important key in order to attain peace. My name is Joe Demek. I'm a broadcaster with the National Broadcasting Station. It has been uh, my first experience attending such a symposium, which, is, which was very, very important, not just because of the four main speakers with their different point of views on the theme of this symposium, but also some very important and interesting questions from the floor. Um, and it shows that such events are very useful, very important to uh, disseminate uh, peace among every nation, among every religion, um, and uh, even shows how, uh, even though everlasting peace is such an, an impossibility to achieve, but uh, seminars and symposiums such as this one will uh, give a very small contribution towards that goal. So I wish well the organizers, the organizers of this symposium, and I thank everyone who participated in such an event. Thank you.